Well, welcome back class. Uh, this is our fourth lesson on genetics and in this lesson we're really going to get into the to the meat of this topic. Uh, to give you a quick uh, recap, the last uh, couple of lessons we've talked about methods used to study evolution and uh, and the, the history of of the earth. Uh, we talked about you know the fossil record and uh, radioisotope dating and genetic methods to study the homology of different uh, proteins to construct phylogenetic trees from genetic information and we also talked a bit about vestigial organs and adaptation in this lesson we're going to begin with that topic of, of adaptation but we're going to focus on the genetic basis for adaptation and we're going to uh, discuss how this is really based on changes or mutations in DNA. Now we've talked about DNA being a very stable molecule but it is a molecule and it is not perfectly stable. It will undergo what are called mutations. Uh, these can be point mutations where a particular DNA base is somehow randomly converted to another base uh, or it, these, this could be insertions of, a, of sequences of bases or deletions of bases or even shuffling around of, of bases. And so that when the DNA replicates uh, through mitosis that you would, uh, you would carry along that, that mutation. And if that leads to expression of a different protein, then we have this possibility of what we will talk about natural selection that is if a mutation leads to a production of a protein that provides a selective advantage of that daughter cell uh, to survive in the environment due to whatever the challenges are in the environment then through natural selection we will select for that that particular cell will have us uh, an advantage in survival going back to mutations in DNA for just a second if you could imagine just as an analogy uh, having a, in the old days where we'd have scribes that would transcribe uh, long books and occasionally they would make a mistake they would copy the wrong word or copy the wrong letter so that's what we're talking about even though DNA is a very stable molecule over long periods of time as DNA is replicated over and over again there can be these occasional mutations now I'm going to talk about a number of specific examples in the next few slides we'll talk about sickle cell syndrome We'll talk about the development of, re, of antibiotic resistant bacteria. I won't have time to talk about how the movement of DNA between cells can be facilitated by viruses or what are called transposons. Uh, I would like to briefly mention that the immune response in animals, that is the production of antibodies by animals, actually involves a shuffling of genetic information. That is, our white blood cells, which are antibody producing cells, will produce thousands of antibodies by shuffling around making different combinations of genetic information to express different antibody proteins. If our bodies are challenged by some infection, something we call an antigen, and if that antigen binds to any one of these 1,000 or so antibodies, then that antibody is amplified and becomes the one that is produced by that white blood cell. So uh, the point is that sometimes we have natural selection uh, operating in other ways such as the production of antibodies. Near the top of my list, uh, I skipped over this, but there's something called CCR5 Delta 32. Now, I know it's complicated. And CCR5, that, that, that sort of sounds like the fifth version of uh, the band uh, Clearance Clearwater Revival, which of course is my day. Proud Mary, keep on jugglin'. Uh, but it is a protein that is on the surface of white blood cells, and it, it's kind of an interesting protein because a particular mutant of this protein called the Delta-32 mutant confers a resistance to the smallpox and bubonic plague uh, to individuals, and this is thought to be why certain people were immune to the bubonic plague back in the 14th century because they had this particular mutant of this protein. Now it is also associated with resistance to the AIDS, uh, infection with AIDS, but Converse, people with this particular mutation have a higher susceptibility to the West Nile virus. So sometimes these mutations can be interesting because you can, they can give you advantages in some ways and disadvantages in another way. And I'll show you that in the next slide. But, but before leaving this slide, I want to return to a quote from one of our favorite philosophers, you know, the, who lived around 400 BC, and that is Democritus, who said, 
Everything existing in the universe is the fruit of chance and necessity. Chance and necessity. Okay, let's talk a little bit about sickle cell trait. And you've probably heard of sickle cell anemia, which is a condition that some people have. It is due to a genetic mutation or a genetic variant. It's uh, actually a variation in the amino acid sequence of hemoglobin. Now, hemoglobin is the protein in our red blood cells that carries or binds and carries oxygen throughout our, our bloodstream. Hemoglobin is, uh, is larger than the protein cytochrome C that we talked about earlier. It's maybe five or six times larger. But this condition called sickle cell trait or sickle cell anemia is due to a mutation in a single amino acid in this fairly large protein. Only one position, that's position six, that is converted from a glutamic acid to a valine. And that single mutation leads to a significant change in the properties of hemoglobin. The hemoglobin molecules for the sickle cell trait tend to stack up on each other, like a stack of plates, for example, and forming a very long cylinder. Well, hemoglobin is normally packaged in these cells called red blood cells. And on the left side of the slide are shown normal red blood cells, which are you know round but with a little indentation, kind of cute looking cells. But in, on the right side are shown sickle cells, which have these long stacks of, of hemoglobin packaged inside the cell. Well, this is kind of like sticking a, a baseball bat inside of your backpack. That is, it pokes out. And you can imagine that if you were trying to carry a baseball bat inside your backpack around with you all day long, all the time, it would bang into the doorways, into the, into the halls, and into your desk and all of this, and it would wear out your backpack much more rapidly. So instead of buying a, a, a backpack once every year, you might have to buy a new backpack every month or so. Well, that's what happens with sickle cell anemia. Normal red blood cells circulate through our bloodstream and do have some wear and tear, and they have to be replaced every three or four months. But in sickle cell anemia, due to the elongated shape of the red blood cells, they have more wear and tear, and they must be replaced uh, in less than a month's time in, our, in, in, in the bodies of people with this condition. So the consequence is that people with the condition are, are anemic because they have to be constantly replacing their red blood cells. But the advantage is that in places in the world where the parasite malaria is prevalent, the malaria parasite lives within red blood cells, and because the lifespan of the sickle cell red blood cells is so short, less than a month, the parasite, the malaria parasite, cannot reproduce in the red blood cells of people with sickle trait. So the point is that sometimes mutations lead to disadvantages, and sometimes they lead to advantages depending upon the environment and the challenges. In this next slide we talk about the adaptation of bacteria to antibiotics. Now antibiotics are those chemicals, those substances, either synthetic or natural, that kill or inhibit the growth of bacteria. Uh, one of the best known examples is penicillin. Penicillin is actually made by fungi as a, me as a defense mechanism to to ward off bacteria from infecting the fungi. And when scientists discovered this chemical warfare occurring between microorganisms, they took advantage of it to develop antibiotics for human use to protect us against infections such as Streptococcus pneumonia. Now what resistance is all about is the following. Let's say that you have, and if you look at the bottom left slide, you have a, a sample that contains bacteria, maybe Maybe 99% of the bacteria in a sample are normal bacteria, which can be killed by an antibiotic. But maybe one or a small number of these bacteria have evolved through random processes, ran, through random mutations of their DNA, have evolved a defense mechanism, such as a mutation of a protein, which can now break down the antibiotic, so the antibiotic no longer will work against it. That would be the yellow uh, bacterium in the on the left. So if you then treat that sample of bacteria with the antibiotic, you would kill the normal bacteria, or most of the normal bacteria, but not the one that has randomly developed the mutation to give it resistance to the bacteria. Then if you try to continue to grow those bacteria, only a few of the normal bacteria might be able to continue to, to grow or to reproduce, 
but the resistant bacteria would then take over and would multiply and so that after a while you would have only the resistant bacteria surviving. Survival of the fittest. Survival of the fittest in the presence of some environmental challenge. Now the development of drug resistant bacteria is becoming a very large problem. The first row in this slide gives the name of a number of antibiotics. You would probably recognize some of these names, penicillin, tetracycline, streptomycin. All, all of these and almost all antibiotics in use now have drug-resistant bacteria strains. And there are also things called multi-drug resistant bacteria. And this has become a growing problem. Sometimes these are called superbugs. That, for which there are few, if any, remaining antibiotics that will actually kill these superbugs. Uh, MRSA, methicillin resistant Staph aureus, is a, is a serious problem in hospitals as well. Staph aureus causes uh, skin infections. What makes this frustrating is that less than half of the antibiotics that are actually made are actually used for the clinical treatment of diseases in humans. Less than half are used for humans. More than half then are used in animal feed against animal diseases and as disinfectants. Now of course what this does is by having so many antibiotics in our environment it actually induces more and more drug resistant bacteria. The graph in the bottom right shows the percentage of bacteria that are now resistant to an antibiotic called vincomycin and you can see that be uh, Beginning around 1990, there has been a significant increase in the number of vincomycin-resistant strains of bacteria. Now let's, let's give an, another example of adaptation and, and evolution. Uh, and this time let's talk about uh, Roundup. Roundup, you might recognize, is a herbicide. Uh, I grew up on a farm. Some of you may have grown up on a farm and may have heard of, of Roundup and how it's used as, as a herbicide in, if you're growing cotton or soybeans or corn. Uh, the active ingredient of Roundup is something called glyphosate. That's just a particular chemical. Roundup will kill weeds, but it also will stunt the growth of the cotton or the soybean or the corn. Well, Monsanto, the, the chemical company that makes Roundup, they came up with this idea, which seemed like a very good idea, to create glycophosate resistant forms or strains of cotton, soybean, and corn through genetic modifications. And the idea was that if you had strains of cotton, let's say, that were resistant to Roundup, you could grow those Roundup resistant strains and, and apply the, the herbicide Roundup and you would be killing the weeds but you wouldn't be stunning the growth of the crops. Kill the weeds, but not the crops. So that seemed like a great idea. Unfortunately, you know, you go forward a, a decade or so after this was has been done, and now there are now at least 20 weeds that have evolved resistance to Roundup. Why? Because so much of this herbicide is in the environment that it leads to the to the natural selection of weeds that are also resistant to the herbicide. A quote, it's, uh, it is the single largest threat to production agriculture that we've ever seen. What we're talking about here is Darwinian evolution in fast forward. And that leads to the discussion of Charles Darwin and speciation because what is happening in some cases when you have these random mutations leading to the formation of an organism that can survive against the new environmental challenge. If this can be propagated through offspring, this can in some cases lead to new species. Now Charles Darwin uh, is a, a scientist who, who studied this process. To be sure, Darwin was not the uh, first scientist to understand or to write about Evolution. In fact, evolution was a was a well known phenomenon when Darwin was uh, was doing his studies. What Darwin came up with in his famous book, The Origin of Species, was a driving mechanism for evolution. That driving mechanism being natural selection or survival of the fittest. And more is 
essentially what we just said. That is, if you could have a random mutation that would lead to an organism having a survival advantage in the presence of an environmental challenge, and if that could be passed on to offspring, then that offspring and that new gene would become the dominant gene in that environment, a dominant organism in that environment, and that could over time lead to uh, a separate species. Darwin was a young scientist on uh, taking a voyage around the world on this boat called the Beagle, and he they stopped over at the Galapagos Islands, and he began taking notes looking at the uh, the turtles and the finches and and making notes and describing them and he found at, in the in the Galapagos Island that the, these are uh, islands close to one another that the different islands had different turtles some of them were saddleback uh, turtles some were what he called intermediate some were were dome shaped turtles in terms of their shell and he no noted in his notebook the most remarkable feature in this natural history of this archipelago is that the different islands are inhabited by different sets of beings. And the inhabitants, the people who live in the island, state that they can distinguish the, the tortoises from the different islands. That if there's enough geographic separation, the different species can evolve so that you can actually distinguish one from the other in, in terms of different species. Um, I want to also share with you what is one of my favorite quotes from Darwin. This is a quote from a letter he wrote to a friend. He says, I have no books which tell me much, and what they do I cannot apply to what I see. I draw my own conclusions, and most gloriously ridiculous ones they are. I just love that quote, uh, because that talks about the, uh, the excitement of, of research and exploring the unknown. So in this lesson, we've talked about adaptation and how this is based on uh, mutations uh, in the DNA and then, then the natural selection of the mutated DNA to lead to a species that has a selective advantage against the environmental challenge, or in other words, survival of the fittest. We will now pause, and uh, in the next lesson, we will talk about, we'll get to the, the really, really tough questions, and that is, how did life begin? And we'll talk about what we know or think we know and, and about what we don't know about uh, how life began. Okay, see you in a while.